Sometimes I come in and the kirtan is just on fire. And so, you know, you just got to let it work itself out. Sometimes I come in and I feel like the singer just wants to hear the sound of his own voice for a couple <laughs> mantras more. And, you know, there's a, I don't know, how many of you guys lead kirtan? Raise your hand. There's a cadence. There's a, there's a top off. There's a crescendo that you build up to. And then you got to back down from it a little bit and wind it up. You got to, there's an arc. So I was like, oh, there's like, I was, I was thinking like, what are you doing? Like, what's like, there's like a few more. Then the beat changes and this and that, but I couldn't figure out for the life of me what was like, what was going on there. <laughs> That's my attempt to shame you into being more conservative next time. Um, well, I got a verse I thought of. Yeah. Most Hindu-esque groups around these days. You ever hear like that yoga is not Hindu? Have you ever heard that or said that? Like yoga's not religious, yoga's not Hindu. Have you heard that before? That's a lie. I mean, that, that's just, it's just plainly dishonest. You could say Hinduism isn't Hindu. You could say that because the word Hindu does not occur in the Vedic literatures. So in the books of the Hindus, you don't find the word Hindu. Did you guys follow that? So the word Hindu is not a self-designator. It's a geographical term that was used by Persian merchants to designate the people who were on the other side of the Indus River. Like you've heard of the Indus Valley Civilization, IVC. So the Indus Valley Civilization, roughly in modern day Pakistan, which was part of India up until 1947. Um, India and Pakistan separated in 1947, just at the tail end, beginning uh, at the tail end of World War II. Right after World War II, the British Army was completely um, debilitated, and the British Empire was incredibly weakened by the prolonged conflict with the Germans. And so many colonies of, uh, of Britain won their independence around that time. And India had been threatening its own revolt against the colonialist British. And Hitler had a deal with the Indian freedom fighters that when they captured the uh, Indian soldiers who were conscripted into the military by the British and forced to fight for their colonizers, forced to fight for their masters, for lack of a better term, when they captured the Indian soldiers fighting on behalf of the British in places like North Africa, where they did a lot of the fighting, they sent them down to Singapore and Malaysia, and they trained them to then be a part of the Indian National Army under Subhash Chandra Bose, who were then going to fight against the British after World War II was over. Let me just say that again. Hitler and the Nazis had a deal with the Indians to give them back their soldiers so they could fight against the British. Did you guys follow that? It's like a weird piece of history that's, you know, well documented, can't be denied. So Hitler, who's you know, like just the worst genocidal maniac I mean, he really didn't do as bad as Stalin or Mao. Mao killed 40 million people, 
Stalin killed 20 million. Hitler only killed a measly 10, 12 million. But it was just really, like, it was like really just, you know, Mao killed 20 million people because they messed up on planting crops. Between 1962 and 64, they had this massive famine where they tried to um, centralize all the farming in China. And they had some bad weather and they made some mistakes and they ended up killing 20 million people. Then they killed another 20 million. Stalin killed 20 million. Um, and, but, you know, Hitler was like a surgical genocide of the Jewish people. He managed to wipe out 30, 30%, 35% of their numbers in a period of just a few years. And there was, like a, there was like a racism and a bigotry and a purposeful genocide instead of just the bloody mess that is a, a coup and a revolution, which was more, you know, for Stalin and for Mao. Did I do okay? He has a degree in history, so I always like defer to my man whenever I'm getting into this stuff. Um, so Hindus were, it's, it's a term coined by the, the Persian traders who eventually became the, I mean, you want to get somebody worse than the British and Stalin and Hitler and Mao all put together? Look no further than the Muslim rulers of India. They reigned for over 900 years, and during that reign they killed, anybody know? 100 million Hindus over almost 1,000 years. Worst genocide in the history of the world. up there with like the plague like it's like the numbers are that staggering it's up there with the plague that's the only other event I'm aware of in the history of mankind that killed those kind of numbers maybe the ice age <laughs> but you know, like yeah, 8,000 years ago but, but the, 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 the great plague which decimated a third of the world's population essentially the population didn't increase for several hundred years, like 300 years or something like that. Um, yeah, so the Islamic occupation of India killed 100 million people. Certain Muslim rulers would demand 100,000 Brahmin threads be placed before them of slain Brahmins before they would take their, their meal. They would get angry and just kill 100,000 people. I mean, it's, it was, it's just, it's almost like, it's, 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 it's not inconceivable, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling when you start to think about the magnitude. Um, anyway, despite the fact that the Muslims ruled India for a thousand years, oftentimes with an iron fist, Hindus and Muslims managed to live in relative peace. It's interesting if you look at, you know, I mean, there's, there's rules. Uh, you know, you, you cannot preach your religion. If, if your country is ruled by Islam, it's called Dar al Salam, a house of peace. And it doesn't mean that the Muslims have to be the majority of the population, but they do have to be in charge and they have to enforce Sharia law. And so if they enforce Sharia law, that means that the Hindu houses of worship can never be built up. So they have to be in a constant state of sort of disrepair and dilapidation. You can't preach. You have to pay a tax for being Hindu every year. It's called the jizya. You have to pay a tax every year for the privilege of being a Hindu in a Muslim ruled country. These rules are still followed in the Middle East currently. We have Hare Krishna temples in the Middle East. They're totally unrecognizable from the outside. You're never allowed to do any outreach to Muslim people. It's only for the Hindus who move to that place to work. They have to keep it totally insular. They're not allowed to minister to anybody. And they're not allowed to advertise any of their programs. And everything has to be done on the DL, on the quiet, on, and, and, and then it's allowed to go on. 
what I mean is in 2021 in Dubai and Oman and Muscat, like that's what's going on. Do you guys know that? So we'll have like a Rathiatra, you know, Rathiatra up in LA with 40 foot high chariots. We own Main Beach. They give Main Beach to us. We build, a, like, it's ridiculous, right? Have you ever seen anything like it? I've never seen an event where they take over Main Beach and Venice Beach. Have you guys ever seen that? Anybody else do it? I grew up in Venice. I've never seen it. The Hare Krishnas are the only people who ever do it. We serve about 20,000 plates of food. We have 40 foot high chairs. We have these massive stages, full sound, multiple stages, full sound system. Am I wrong? What was going on there? What would you say? <laughs> it's true. It's true. When I was living in Venice, we used to walk uphill to school both ways, five miles in the snow, barefoot. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a joke. <laughs> Obviously, you guys are too young to know. But anyway, um, when I was a kid growing up, the gangs ruled Venice. VSLC and V13, Venice Shoreline Crips and Venice 13. They ruled Venice. And there were drive-by shootings every day, and it was violent, and there were fights every single day on the beach. And it was like in gunplay, the whole thing. It was like, it was a dangerous place. And the homeless, so I, I'd take the homeless over that any day of the week. But you're right, they have moved in. Of course, if I was homeless, if I was homeless, I would for sure move to Laguna Beach. For sure. Like, given that you're homeless, right, you get to live wherever you want because you're homeless. So why not move to the bougiest, nicest, most mild weather place that exists? You don't go south of the border because then there's a whole host of other problems you have to contend with. Um, but at least north of the border, you know, San Diego, Orange County, Beach Town. I cite the Venice guys, they, just, they need to just mobilize a little bit, explore their surroundings. If they just walk 20, 30 miles south, it gets even nicer. But I mean, it's, it's like Skid Row or Venice Beach. I would for sure pick Venice Beach. Right? Yeah. Right? I would totally pick Venice Beach over Skid Row. Skid Row's rough. Um, who's hung out in Skid Row before? Raise your hand. What are you people doing? <laughs> it's like the, the night train express over here. <laughs> Raise your hand if you got that reference. Night Train Express? Yeah. <laughs> Night Train was a brand of fortified wine. Alcohol companies make fortified wine. It's wine with triple the normal alcohol content of wine. And they sell it for like $1.99 for... It's the next level up from a 40. Like if you're doing like a 40 of old E or something like that, the next level of drunken debauchery and wine-oness is you start buying fortified wine. And so the popular ones were Thunderbird and Night Train. You guys ever heard of this? The stuff I know, right? <laughs> so when you're, you know, if you're a, if you're a wino, you want to buy the absolute maximum amount of alcohol you can for the minimum amount of money because the only purpose of drinking alcohol is to get loaded and you have to get loaded all day every day and you're broke because you're a wino and you're living on the streets and you can only you know beg so much like you know if you're like a crack addict or something like that you're all or a meth head you're all motivated you're like out on the streets trying to make money and make it happen but if you get into alcohol you're just like you know part of the gig is you're 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 embracing a totally lethargic lifestyle. And so they can't get that motivated to you know, get their can out and beg. So they're looking for the cheapest 
alcohol delivery vehicle and leave it to like Seagram's and all the other alcohol companies, they have a product. They have a product for the hardcore homeless alcoholics of the world. It's called Fortified Wine. And so the popular one. So I said the Night Train Express. There's a Guns N' Roses song called Night Train. That song, that song is about Night Train. <laughs> that song is about the alcohol. You know the song? Right? You know it now, right? All right. So I said, class is over. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just opened a liquor store down the corner. We got you guys covered. <laughs> um, how did I get here? <laughs> ah, the wine that was cheese. You took me on a bad turn, young lady. <laughs> anyway, I'll take the wine that was over the gang members. It's a slower death, more self-imposed, and there's, you know, maybe some more hope. But you know, like the carnage that you would see in the 80s in Venice on the beach was like way worse. So anyway, when we do Ruthiatra, our big huge celebration in Dubai, we rent a building and we build a rough cart in the building and we just go around in circles inside the building. And we never go outside, we don't advertise. So the bell full, we'll have like deities and the carts, and we'll have a kirtan, and it's all done indoors with no advertising. And you wear, like if you want to wear dhoti, you wear you put your dhoti on inside the building. You don't go out of the building wearing a dhoti or a sari. Maybe women, Indian women can get away with wearing a sari, I don't know. But you get dressed in the building because you don't want to insult the Muslim people who rule the country. So when the Muslims ruled India, it was rough. You know, a, a non-Muslim could not give testimony against a Muslim. So a, a Muslim raped a Hindu, and there were only Hindu witnesses to the rape, and no Muslims were willing to testify. There's nobody to convict them. But there was at least some representation in government. They, they had some, you know, they, they, they worked with the majority of the population, 90% of the population, which were Hindus. They worked with them on some level. And so Britain and actually separated the Muslims and the Hindus and, and fomented uh, because they wanted to rule and by making people fight over religious ground it meant they didn't have the energy to fight against the British. So uh, uh, the British engaged in a lot of the British engaged in a lot of like heavy politics inciting violence between Hindus and Muslims. It's well documented. And it culminated the, the Muslims just you know were foaming at the mouth, and India split into Pakistan and India in 1947. And there was a, a mass exodus. There were, you know, tons of Hindus living in Pakistan. There are now, but there were way more. The Sindh people all lived in Pakistan. And they were forced to just drop everything and walk across the border to India. And they were getting slayed on the way. Just absolute you know, carnage on the way. And most of the near misses for nuclear war, because both India and Pakistan have the nuke, most of the near misses for nuclear wars over the last 70, 80 years since the hydrogen bomb was developed have been between India and Pakistan. They're always on the brink of war. The borders are heavily contested. Everybody's fighting all the time. There's always a conventional war going on on the border. And everybody's armed to the teeth, pointing their missiles at one another, ready to drop a nuke you know, like in a moment. So the word Hindu, when you see Hindu people talking to British people or Muslims, they'll call themselves Hindus. But when we're referring to ourselves in our own text, the word Hindu never shows up because it was an outsider's term. So maybe we use that outsider's term when we're talking to the outsiders because it's convenient, because they, you know us by that term, so then we call ourselves by that term. So if you look at medieval Hindu texts, and they're talking about 
Hindu-Muslim interactions, then they will refer to themselves as Hindus. And the Muslims become Yavans, which means Turks, but it became a, a kind of a standard term used for all Muslims, irrespective of whether they were actually from Turkey or somewhere else. And so there were the, the Yavans and the, and the Hindus. But when we're talking about ourselves in our own text, you find that word Hindu never shows up. Interesting, right? So you could say Hinduism isn't Hindu because the whole idea of there being one ism that encapsulates all of the spiritual traditions of ancient India is a very Western Eurocentric idea. It works if you want to study Semitic traditions, Middle Eastern religion, which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which is, you know, two-thirds of the world's population. It's not a small group then this, this one religion model works quite well. Because there's a considerable degree of uniformity. If you look at the Nicene Creed, and you compare Christianity to the Nicene Creed, and you look at core ideas of Christianity, you'll find that 99.9% .9 of Christians believe those ideas. And so there's some nuanced differences, but they're very minor, and on the big stuff, everybody agrees. Do you guys follow this? Little less so with Islam. There's different hadiths, and there's different schools of Islamic jurisprudence, like Hanbali and whatever, and they argue over more stuff, but there's still a considerable degree of uniformity when you're studying Islam. Hinduism, in contrast, you'll find Hindu groups that have more in common with Christians than they do with other Hindu groups from the same area. Because ancient Indian spirituality was diverse, and there's, there's reasons why that was the case, if your religion teaches duality and you're either good or evil, you're right or wrong, you're with us or you're against us, there's heaven and there's hell, there's Jews and Goyim, Christians and heathens, Muslims and infidels, then this whole idea of genocidally wiping out the people who don't believe what you believe makes perfect sense because it's there at the core of your tradition. Did you guys follow that? India wasn't like that. India wasn't like that. It was, it, was, it was an inclusivistic society. There was no indigenous slavery. That's a mind blower. The only slavery in India was brought in by the Muslim rulers. They brought in Ethiopian slaves, who then eventually overthrew them and took over. Did you know that? And so, uh, and so there, were, there were Ethiopian Islamic rulers who ruled India at a certain point during the Mughal period, a brief period. But it's because they were brought in as slaves and they took over. They rebelled. Um, but there's no indigenous slavery in ancient India, which is wild, because slavery was such a part of the ancient world. I mean, it's all over the Jewish texts. It's all over the Islamic texts. But India, with its multi, multi-thousand year history, managed to avoid ever thinking it was okay to own another person. Um, so because of that, there were many different religious persuasions that coexisted peacefully side by side. And that's good when you're forced to live with people and engage with them and bounce ideas off of one another. It creates a culture of tolerance and it's, it's actually it's a good thing for peace. And so, you know, Britain like left this imprint of this Hindu-Muslim divide, which eventually turned into India and Pakistan, and eventually turned into Bangladesh and Bengal. That's East Pakistan. It's on both sides of the country. The Muslims formed their own country, and now it's Jammu and Kashmir. Same thing going on in Jammu and Kashmir. So, yoga, is intrinsically linked to Indic spirituality. And so for the sake of ease, I said it, it's linked to Hinduism. Um, although, like I said, it's an outsider's term. But there's no way to separate yoga from its inherent link to Indic spirituality. 
And the attempt to do so is cultural appropriation, which is a big no-no nowadays. You know, Dr. Seuss, the Redskins, like everybody's getting called out. Cultural appropriation is, it's like, it's like they have like, you know, like Webster's word of the year. Cultural appropriation is the unword of the year. And so if you want to borrow yoga, then it's only respectful if you also acknowledge and to some extent honor its innate link, its inexorable link to spirituality, and specifically the spirituality of these in this huge civilization that flourished thousands of years ago and that you know, left a legacy for the rest of the world to take advantage of. Did you guys follow that? It's just decent and kind. You can, now you can be eclectic on some level, but to try to just say yoga has nothing to do with Indian spirituality, it's, it's just patently false. Okay. That was all just sort of a warmer upper. Um, along with acknowledging the cultural trappings and cultural delivery device of whatever thing inspires you and thereby honoring the people who came up with it. Like I was just talking to somebody yesterday and they were telling me they, I, I counseled somebody and helped some people. This happens to me all the time. I counsel people and then they come back to me and they tell me the stuff I suggested to them as if it's their own idea. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I'm not as dumb as I look, you know? I mean, I like, I've got a reasonable memory. But it's, it's like shameless what people do. You've done this to me, everybody does this to me. In fact, I had this great idea. They said, I'm like, I just told you that 24 hours ago. And so, um, I think it's important when we find a good idea that we honor the tribe of people, the culture that came up with it. We can borrow. You can even be a bit eclectic with it. That's fine too. But you should at least acknowledge where you're, where you're pulling from and take the five minutes or however long it takes to actually understand what it is you're borrowing. Like, I hate reading neo-Hindu literature. Like, if there's a body of literature that makes me want to vomit, like spontaneously. It's neo-Hindu literature, where people are just shamelessly twisting things, putting square pegs in round holes, and just bastardizing a tradition, and which just absolutely no concern whatsoever for preservation, for acknowledgement. It's just cultural appropriation in like the most insulting way possible. Not only did you steal something, but you managed to like destroy it while you stole it. And then you're touting it as your own. And if you look at Neo-Hindu literature, it's for the most part it's written in novel form. People are just really writing their own book and it's their own thoughts and ideas and they pay some lip service to an older tradition because they feel like that authenticates things. You know, like it's like, uh, like how many times do you read a quote from Buddha on Facebook? 
I got news for you. Like 98% of those are not Buddha. It's just like some random person in Minnesota just made something up. I remember some guy came to the temple in Laguna, our temple in Laguna, and we were talking, and he said to me, you know, Krishna has taught in Gita, life is a game, so play it. <laughs> life is a game, so play it. <laughs> he also told me, I like Krishna. He's like the kind of God you could have a beer with. I swear to Krishna he said this to me. I couldn't make this up. It's like, for, in my life, the truth is always better than the story. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, that's like such a nice idea that life is a game, so play. Krishna says that in Gita? He's like, yes. <laughs> he wogged his head very like, very like, smug's not the right word, but like, he was really feeling himself. He's like, he was like <laughs> and so I, I, I said hey you know what I've got a Gita right here in front of me why don't you show me in the Gita where Krishna says life is a game so play and I sat there for like 10 or 12 excruciating minutes while the guy looked for the quote and I, I was like and I was just Slaying him. I was like, you know, because of course you wouldn't lie and quote Krishna. That would be an apparat. Practically, you would have to give up your Hinduism. You should be beaten in the streets. You would be an animal, like a two legged animal, if you were to lie and quote Krishna and you were just making things up. You would never do that because you're not a sinful rascal. And I was like, just throwing every like, dirty but pious term I could possibly throw at him. Like a dog in the street. Foolish monkey jumping around. Like, just <laughs> but I framed it all like, if you had done this, then you would be doing this. Like a conditional statement, if then. And of course you wouldn't do that. And there were witnesses. He had some people with him, and I had some people with me. And we did this together as a family. <laughs> and finally, after just like, just painfully staring at the page of the book, just like not knowing what to do. Like it went from like turning the page just looking at the book and I just saw him like just <laughs> and I finally like snapped the book shut and said let me teach you what Krishna says in Gita and I began quoting verses and I began opening the book and showing him the verses and showing him each individual verse in the Nagari script translating it for him and going through and I said if you want to quote the Gita do it properly. If you don't know the Gita, it's okay. We'll teach you. But don't, don't come here and pretend you know what you're talking about when you don't. It's bad for you, and it's bad for anybody who listens to you. So we, the Hare Krishna movement, are quite unique amongst Hindu groups doing outreach in the West. We are unique in that we translate our sacred texts painstakingly into different language. And if you look at one of our books, you'll see that you see how it's got the Nagari script there for the verse and then underneath it it has a romanization where the verse is written in IAST, a kind of standard Roman letter transliteration with diacritics, so you can read what the original language sounds like. Then it's got a word-for-word -word translation, a full English translation, and then a, a whole purport, which itself is chock full of references to other Vedic texts in the original language. This is normal. Like This is how Hare Krishna devotees learn how to read. Right? We read verses and purports. We read the notes of our gurus explaining the meaning of verses. The verses are there. You can look back and see what the verse says. You can look at the notes 
the, the, the commentate the commentary on it, and you can trace those back to the verse and see the connection points between them and get a real sense of what the text is saying. You follow? Nobody does this. We're unique. And far from this queering your hustle and making it difficult to spread your wings and fly, taking the trouble to unpack the ancient text allows you to A, understand it, and then B, you can pull from it as you want to. And say, I'm pulling this from here, and here's my own two cents on it. And I don't agree with this, or I do agree with this. But without actually understanding what the text says, you can't legitimately take a position on it one way or the other. You don't have the right to an opinion until you take the trouble to understand what you're opining about. So whether you want to agree or disagree or borrow some ideas or develop your own philosophy and be eclectic or deny the validity of the text or like some stuff and don't like other stuff, whatever your game is, whatever you want to do, step A, step A is taking the trouble to legitimately sit with an ancient tradition. You're, of course, free to be a prophet. Just do your own thing. That, that's totally okay. You can just be like, I got a message. Like, like, you know, I saw it, and here's my thoughts. And if people like it, hey, you just birthed a religion. Great. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. But if you want to soak in and understand and dive into and look at a tradition, then you got to take the time and the trouble to let that tradition speak for itself in context, unpack itself. You got to at least have that degree of respect before you pull. Otherwise, it's the worst form of cultural appropriation. So it doesn't bum me out that people write novels or that they give their own ideas. It's the Sanskritization of their ideas, where they take new wine and put it into an old bottle and make it seem like it's more authentic and more ancient. There were lots of stupid ideas in the past. I mean, most of the rest of the world believed in slavery like five minutes ago. And so there's all sorts of awful ideas that were standard in the world throughout most of recorded history. So just being old, there, like, there were awful things going on a long time ago. People were doing awful things. They had awful ideas a long time ago. So just being old doesn't make you good. But you know, with Hinduism, you have a tradition which has been meticulously maintained and practiced for thousands of years. It's the oldest continually practiced religion on the planet. Let me say that again. Wiki it, if you don't believe me. Hinduism is the oldest continually practiced religion on the planet. Obviously, Gobliki Tepe and uh, modern day Turkey and other places, they had older religions that existed in the world, no problem. But those religions died out. Then people came back and it's like, I'm going to practice it again. And they just made something up and tried to say it was that old thing. But paganism died out. Egyptian religion died out. In the 60s and 70s, people tried to bring it back. But what they really brought back was a new thing. Again, new wine put into an old bottle. They do this in India. They do what's called Sanskritization. People will borrow stuff and then give it fancy Sanskrit names, like Surya Namaskar. You guys heard of Surya Namaskar? Namaskar, Namaha Kar, to make obeisance Surya to the sun. Surya Namaskar was invented in 1908.
by the Maharaj of Anand. Surya Namaskar was invented in 1908 in a published piece of literature. You know where it came from? It came from Indian wrestling. Think about what Surya Namaskar really is. Take all the sexy Indianness out of it, and what is it really? It's a burpee. Just think it through. It's a squat and a push up. It's called Dund and Betuk in Indian wrestling. The guy who made the Surya Namaskar, he references the Mala Purana, which is this, this text, Mala Purana, this text of wrestling, which is a couple hundred years old. But they gave it a cool, sexy name, Surya Namaskar. And now, Surya Namaskar. It's like as old as the Vedas. No, you're not. You're doing a burpee. <laughs> you follow this? Burpees are good. It's, it's a great exercise. I mean, come on. There's a reason why prisoners do burpees. There's a reason why people in the military do burpees. It's a great exercise. It's developing your posterior chain, upper body strength, all in one failed swoop, shake a little cardio on there. It's like a great exercise, you know? But it was made up in 1908. The name Surya Namaskar and that particular version of it, 1908. But then people would be like, no, no, Surya Namaskar Prayers to the sun are there in the Rig Veda, the most ancient of all Vedic texts, going back thousands and thousands of years. You can find Surya Namaskar, prayers to the sun, which is true. But what's the, where was the, where was the fallacy in that? There's no burpee. The fact that there are prayers to the sun, they're called Surya Namaskar thousands of years ago, and then a dude made a burpee and called it Surya Namaskar, doesn't in any way, shape, or form connect those two things. You follow? Does that make sense? Like if I, if I like bought a building, I like will probably buy this building in the next couple of years. If I bought a building, and then we, we called it the Ark of the Covenant, People are like, you're pretty full of yourself. And I'm like, we were prophesized in the Hebrew Bible thousands of years ago. You follow? You take a new thing and you slap an old name on it and then people start to think it's really old. That's Sanskritization. And to somebody who knows the tradition, it's simultaneously repulsive and angering because you're watching people twist your words to make a trap for fools. To use the words of Kipling. To see the words you've spoken, to see the truths you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. That's the line. If you can see the words you've spoken twisted by knaves, that means ignorant people, to make a trap for fools. So, we are part of a tradition which has meticulously preserved itself for thousands upon thousands of years. And that's why we take the trouble to introduce people to original texts in the original language and to work through it. Because it connects us all to something very, very ancient. There's a commentatorial tradition which is like, you can't even understand a Vedic text. I mean, some texts are written very simply, the Gita, but if you get into like more poetic works, you can't even understand them without a commentary. And there, there's this multi-thousand year commentatorial tradition which unpacks the text and which allows you to like, it's like a rabbinic commentary over thousands of years. It allows you to deeply enter into the text and when you read it, you're like, wow, these guys really understood it. 
the text was more of a mnemonic device. It was signpost to a very elaborate philosophical argument, which was preserved by tradition and passed down from guru to disciple. And when you learn the philosophical arguments that are made, you can see that that's what the verse is saying. Sometimes the verse will just be like a list of words, like names. But then the commentator says, these names reference this, that, and the other thing, and they'll explain it all. And when you read it, you're like, oh my God, that's what the author was doing. And a lot of times the author himself will write the verse, and then he'll write his own auto-commentary to explain the verse, because the verse is made to be poetic and memorizable so that you can... Um, remember. And it acts as a, a mnemonic stimuli to trigger years and years of learning that you've accomplished. But you carry these triggers or these stimuli around in the form of verses that you've remembered that open up to an entire tradition and lifetimes of knowledge distilled for you and passed down. So when you show up at a regular Hare Krishna temple, you know, we talk about night train, And we talk about you know, the, the, golden, the golden era of gang violence in Southern California. And we compare beach cities for homeless people, it's habitation. And you know, we, we throw in a bit of history, rip on the British with their colonialist spirit, and like, let people know about the huge genocidal holocaust that affected the Indian people. And, we, like, we get into like all sorts of stuff, and the, the, the Hindu, the actual, the word Hindu is somewhat derogatory as a reference for other people, and it was part of this, you know, just just natural tendency in the West to try to fit everything into their Eurocentric model because it worked for them. They assumed it would work for other traditions, and you know, if postmodernism and subjectivism and and uh, anthropology, cultural anthropology has taught us anything. It's that you shouldn't just take your lens and foist it upon somebody else and assume it's going to work. So we do a lot of that. And then we also get into looking at ancient texts in the original language. Do you follow this? And so when I, if I think about like what's at the essence of yoga and its connection to spirituality, and what's at the essence of spirituality in general, what's the core of any spiritual tradition, any religion, anywhere in the world, in any culture, I think this nails it. So let me read it to you. Kim pramatasya bahubi parokshai hayanai iha. Kim. Kim is the standard interrogative in Sanskrit. It means what? Kinkar means servant. Many of our prayers say, O oh Krishna, I am your servant. Ainanda tunujo kinkaram. Kinkar. Kinkar means what do? In other words, you ask the person who you serve, what should I do? And that makes you a what do, a servant. <laughs> so, kim, kim pramatasya. What of the mad, bahubi, of their many hayanaiha, of their many years and lifetimes in this world, in in, in, in a bewildered, maddened state. What that means in context is what's the value of living a full lifetime pursuing materialism? You follow? The nature of this world is that everything you grasp a hold of, all the things you grab, The nature of this world is all the things you grab and hold on to, they decay while you hold on to them. You know what else decays while you hold on to it? Your own body that you're grabbing it with. We're chained to the carcasses of dying animals. And so this verse is saying, in context, 
And I can demonstrate the context, not just by looking at the commentaries, but by looking at the selection of verses I'm quoting from. Kim pramatasya bahubi hayanai iha. What to speak of a lifetime in this world madly chasing after materialism, which is guaranteed to slip away and decay while you hold on to it. Parok shai, what is, what's the value of an inexperienced life? Paroksha means Aksha means eyes, and paro means like uh, uh, of another from someone else's. So what's the use of living your whole life in this world, miserably following after other people and madding, maddeningly chasing after materialism? Do you guys follow this? Kim pramatasya bahubi parok shai hayanaiha. What's the value of a long life in this world uselessly chasing after keeping up with the Joneses? And just living as a body. Vara mohutam viditam gotate shreya se yataha. Better one moment of knowledge. Varam means better. Mohurtam. A mohurta is just a few minutes. It's like 40 minutes. Or an hour and a half. Mohurtas are different, uh, different periods of time throughout the day. The shortest ones are going to last about 40 minutes. The longest ones last about an hour and a half. So, better just one mohurta. A few moments. Viditam of actual knowledge. Yata, by which you'll be inspired. Gatate shreyase. Gatate shreyase. To, to chase after, to strive for, to busy yourself with. Gatate means like to become like busy and occupied with and like interested in. Shreyas. The highest thing. Shreyas and Prayas are Sanskrit co correlates. Prayas is apparent happiness in this world, and Shreyas is spiritual happiness. You know this, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, you're from India, right? Yeah. You heard these terms growing up? Or you learned them from us? So you heard this before, right? Shreyas and Prayas are very common in Hindu, like Dharma and Hindu circles. If, you're, if you were born in our tribe, then you, you learn it from us. But your average Indian will have heard about, usually, if you're like an educated Hindu, you would have heard of Shreyas and Prayas, very common terms. Prayas is apparent happiness, material happiness in this world, and Shreyas is ultimate happiness, a higher sense of happiness. So, Kim Pramatasya Bahubi Parokshai Hayanaiha, what's the value of your whole lifetime being spent? madly chasing after sense gratification, never really living, following your body and your senses, but not actually sitting in your own consciousness, not taking the trouble to distill your consciousness from the body, spending your whole life playing the virtual reality video game that is this world, identifying with what you're not forgetting that you're consciousness, that you're pure, that you're eternal, and buying in the illusion that I'm a dying carcass, I'm a dying body, and all I've got access to is my senses, and I can't stretch beyond them. To buy into that cloistered, suffocating, narrow virtual reality. Better one moment of full consciousness. By which you'll be inspired to chase after something higher. Do you guys follow that? As far as I can see, as far as my intelligence will allow, that is the essence of spirituality. It's that response to the existential dilemma 
of what am I doing here? I'm in this body, the body's decaying, everything's falling apart, nothing remains. There's a, sometimes some people respond to that by becoming just full sensualists, trying to forget themselves and drown themselves in, like, in the pleasures of the flesh. Some people respond to it like that. Some people become diabetic, they want to kill themselves. Some people you just do, like, there's a million things people do. They try and leave a legacy, they try to put their name on a building. So many things people do. But some people respond to that existential dilemma by deciding, let me try to experience consciousness beyond the body. Let me try to break free from the matrix. Let me try to wake up. Let me try to see a deeper reality that's going on. As far as I can see, that's the essence of spirituality. And my evidence for that is the very term spiritual, not etymologically, which just means you breathe, but the very term spiritual, based on the idea that your spirit, your consciousness is in your breath. Um, because when you stop breathing, you die. The respiration, spiritual, they have the same root, spirit. And so, um, not the etymology of the word, but the way the word spiritual is used in English. Spiritual is distinct from material. So spirituality is a belief there's something beyond materialism. There's something beyond this physical world. There's something else going on. There's something deeper going on. Consciousness goes beyond simply being a derivative property of matter. Consciousness is itself a quantum of existence. And I'm interested in that. I want to explore that. That's spirituality in any religion, in any philosophy. If you don't believe that, then you're an atheistic philosopher, you're a materialist philosopher, and you're not a spiritualist. And so it's not that you have to necessarily like, become like a card-carrying Hindu and put on a bindi, and put sindur in your hair, and like wear a sari everywhere. It's not necessarily that you need to do that. But at least we need to understand that yoga as a physical process was about bringing the body and the breath under control so you could begin to distill consciousness from it. At least you got to honor that much. You can then say, and I don't believe that, but that's where all the breath work comes from. And I'm just really into like, for me, you know, yoga is no different than spin. And so it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's the cardio I like to do on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You could do that. Just take the trouble to understand what's actually being communicated. Then I'm okay with you culturally appropriating it and doing whatever you want to do with it. And so when I think about, like, what's the bare bones minimum to appreciate the spirituality of any tradition, it's understanding it as a response to the existential dilemma created by deeply thinking about the nature of this world and the paltriness and the trivialness and the myopia and the, the, the insanity of spending your whole life chasing after things to just have them be taken away from you. And it's a subversive response. I go, wait a second, I am not of this world. I'm not this body. I'm something more then what you are, that becomes the specifics of any tradition. Okay. So to wrap this all up with a bow tie. Night train and all. Um, I'm okay with people inventing new religions. I'm okay with people borrowing stuff and eclectically putting stuff together. I'm okay with people disagreeing. I'm okay with people doing their own thing. No problem. I mean, who am I anyway? But I'm a fan. Freedom of religion, First Amendment, I'm into it. I'm a fan. But something I do personally is as I'm exploring a tradition, 
take the trouble to actually understand it. Because it's rude and crude and harmful and duplicit and disrespectful not to. And our tradition, what's known as Hinduism, is the oldest continually practiced religion in the world. And how does that happen? We take the trouble to memorize these mnemonic devices and to understand them and carry them around with us. And that's why we preserve it. It's not just that we like this was our thing. It's necessary to be able to really learn the tradition and maintain its integrity as you go through the world putting old wine in a new bottle. That's okay. New wine in the old bottle, that's duplicit. Old wine, new bottle, means you keep the essence and you change the details. I'm down for that. And so your average high Christian devotee knows many verses. Kim Pramatasya Bahubi Prokshe Hayanaiha. Varma Hutam Viditam. Katatay Shreya Sei. Katatay Shreya Sei Yataha. We learn these verses. We memorize them, carry them around. We understand what they mean. And so then even we do that, I still think you can get to an essence of all things. I still think you can find a thread of continuity that ties all things together. But you don't do it by just dismissing the specifics of every tradition. You do it by actually spending enough time with each tradition to figure out like, what's really going on. What's really tying these things together. And so if I had to like, there was like one thing I was going to say about all spiritual traditions that they have in common. They are a response to the existential dilemma. Where instead of becoming hopeless or drowning in materialism or turning your brain off and becoming numb, you turn inside and you explore consciousness. And you go beyond the body. How you do that, how you conceive of the, the origin of everything, what you conceive of the soul's nature as being, that makes up the specifics. But all spiritual traditions will have this in common because just by, by the very nature of the term spiritual, it's distinguished from materialism. And there's plenty of room for materialistic philosophies or atheistic philosophies, but they, by definition, wouldn't be spirituality. So if you're looking for what all spiritual traditions of the world have in common, even the warring factions of Islam and Hinduism and Judaism and Christianity and all the different variations, they are a response to the existential dilemma. And they're people trying to look within and find something deeper. And as such, you'll find verses like this in all traditions. Okay. IGTV, thank you very much. Zoom and Facebook, thank you guys very much. It was lovely.